más, amigos. Welcome back to the Harbor. I'm your host, the Kino Cowboy. I'm with Scott and Casher. And today we're finally, I'm surprised it took this long, talking about Yodorowski or Jodorowski or however you pronounce it. You it should know. be Hodorowski because it's, yeah, he's I like, know. he's I know. like, I, French I, I, some people say Hodorowski, some people say Yodorowski, some people say Jodorowski. He's Fr- French Chilean, sorry. Yeah. So um, oh. he's our boy. Uh, I decided to go with a more coherent, uh, film of his for the first uh, talk it's called Santa Sangre and it's definitely one of those movies that when I was first getting deeper into film stuck with me for all these years and so of course I gotta make my boys watch it but um, I will say the first time I watched it I was just I was taken in by the story and and, and the the dreamlike nature in which he makes his films and stuff but this time rewatching it was a different story uh this time i was kind of more introspective and more uh brought to my own trauma of of, uh, my past and seeing how poetically it's displayed in this movie kind of uh got emotions out of me i didn't expect so we'll get into that in just a minute no, I connected real deeply with this movie because uh, my father was a circus performer who murdered prostitutes. Good one. <laughs> Man, I kind of, I like the drip of Orgo. Might be one of my <laughs> favorite drips ever. That guy's drippy as fuck and just like ridiculously over the top for being a domestic abuser. It, he he <laughs> reminds me of like that lead singer of Poison. What's his name? Brett Michaels doesn't look like that. You're Brett thinking Michaels? Of, you're <laughs> no, thinking he kind of reminds me of Brett Michaels. No, you're thinking of Motley Crue. Brett Michaels looks good still. You're thinking of fucking Motley Crue, uh, Vince, whatever his name is. Uh, he kind of reminds me of Brett Michaels, dude. Where are you getting Brett Michaels from? <laughs> no, he does not look like the guy from Poison. I'm fucking, we're stopping this right here. Stopping right here. <laughs> oh, he does look, look more like the guy from Motley Crue. I'm going to put, yeah, in, in like editing, Vince I'm going to put up a couple of photos and let the <laughs> let the viewers decide. <laughs> Vince Neal, he looks one. like fucking... Fucking Vince Neal. He does. He, he looks like every leather-necked, you know, <laughs> no sunscreen, chain-smoking old ex-rocker. But in El Circo Gringo, in the Gringo Circus. <laughs> the funniest thing watching this movie was when I started it up was Scott's, Scott asking me if he could watch this with his family. And then, <laughs> then the film opens with Yodorowsky's son naked, fucking in an insane asylum, eating a fish. And I was ah! like, "Yeah, I would love to see Scott's family watch this movie." <laughs> I think. Oh, Tim- I knew. I knew the answer, but I kind of wanted to see what you would say. Yeah. Tim- would be like, "This is you." You mentioned it earlier. Compared to um, something like the Holy Mountain, this is a very straightforward film comparatively. Yeah. yeah. Compared to. Shawshank it's not but compared yeah. to his other work very yeah 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 and um uh, w- what what the film boils down to is really it's the most extreme examples of an abusive father and then the controlling narcissistic mother and I didn't have a controlling narcissistic mother but my girlfriend does so I've gotten to learn the ins and outs of that psychological connection. And so I find I found that way more fascinating this time, uh, especially like because I, I kind of uh, did some research and deep dived into that uh, mother daughter relationship. Uh, it's an interesting uh, psychology, if you will. Well, um, and just the relationships between mothers and daughters. And well, how it, how the mom can try to live vicariously through uh the the kid and and all parents do that all these manipulative tactics to keep them around in their lives and stuff and this is like the most extreme example of that in this movie obviously but of course i i did write one of my notes in here is just what the f were 
Whoa. Did my yes. mic go out? Uh, uh, my mic. Audio, yeah, your audio's going out, Scott. Okay. I slammed it down on my this doesn't plug in well and I slammed it. Yeah, it doesn't up. plug in well at all. Anyway, what were you saying? Oh, I was just one of my notes was just what the F are Jodorowsky's parents like if he made this movie? He he also had two writers, uh <laughs> co-writers. This is a a what what is it? A Mexican Italian production set in Mexico. So and he, spoken he had, in English. Spoken yeah, it's in, fucking well, weird. Well, it's like they couldn't decide, so they're just like, let's go with English. Middle ground, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but um it's an interesting choice. I've never seen a movie where that's filmed one place or said takes place another place, and then the language is also completely different. Yeah. But it's, you know, uh, convenient for us, I guess. Yeah, no, yeah. thankfully. But um because yeah. English is the only language I appreciate. So yeah, the film opens with uh, a guy uh, in an insane asylum, or you know, like a mental home, I guess would be more polite. Uh, yeah, it's pretty. The by the Spanish conditions, I think it's, by the conditions of it, I think insane asylum actually applies. Oh uh, yeah, I'm. Just, it looks like cuckoo's nest type shit. Uh, yeah, so, or worse. But, um, but they're, I don't know. They're actually kind of nice. They're uh, it, they take them to movies and stuff. Yeah, and which what's we'll weird is this is back in the day, I guess, where most pretty much everybody he seems to be with seems to be not insane just mentally challenged yeah so which is kind of odd so it's not like crazy people it's yeah. just you know yeah just like people with down syndrome who ha- who are like what do we do with these people let's put them all in a giant psychiatric hospital yeah why uh, sad uh yeah it is sad but and, um, then, and then there's him who's like a head taller than everybody else because and he's also completely far gone batshit like, yeah. yeah it's like and, tra- the trauma response yeah like, and it, you're wondering how did this person get to the state of course it goes in onto his tattoo and that's where the first third of the film is all you you get the string of each traumatic memory that led up to this point and um it starts with him as a boy and his family and him are in a circus yeah, uh, you know, a smaller end, greasier circus. <laughs> like, or his dad owns the circus. Even it's yeah. like ringmaster. Yeah. it's it's like it's basically it's a step below the circus from a bug's life. It's that level. <laughs> yeah. Can I yeah, uh, can I just point out that Jodorowsky's sons play both phoenixes, young yeah. and old. I was like, when I first saw this, I was like, holy shit! Yeah. Whoever they got to play the kid looks exactly like the 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 older one. And then I looked at yeah. like, oh. It's their brothers, and rest in peace to the older brother. He passed yeah, away. Yeah, for sure. Year. Yeah, but I thought it was crazy. Well, good old Nepo babies. <laughs> <laughs> probably knowing Jodorowsky, he probably said, "I must use my real son." He probably had that. Um, well, he uses the son in uh, El Topo too when he's uh, much younger, yeah. and, or uh, he's like, "I, I can, I can, I can save and just controversially too because yeah. the kid appears nude a lot in the movie, you know." But you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway. This one, he kind of treats them. He, this kid has to do a couple effed up scenes, yeah. Uh, which yeah. is, this, but uh, like, it, it we'll make, starts we'll out make though, the like... performance real by actually traumatizing my son. <laughs> 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 I uh, I do like this. The starting scene, it's nice and it's very important, but it's like he forms that silent connection with the deaf uh girl and who's like too afraid to do the flaming type rope and stuff. Obviously, that's important. And, By that sexy ass tattooed woman. Yeah, and um, Jesus, yeah, that that tattooed woman who is definitely flirting with <laughs> his dad, and and that's the thing is that he's so many times in this movie as a kid he he's uh, spectating things that he should not be spectating, and this is the start of that, and. Uh, He's too young to understand that the why the way the lady's acting so sensual around the father and stuff. And, you know, throwing knives is an intense fucking thing. And She's just uh, like fucking really sensualizing it, getting really sexually explicit. Yeah. yeah. Not, knives are a phallic metaphor throughout this whole movie. And that's established very early while yeah. she's licking the knife that she's whatever. I assume with those knives, this is off topic. They for the circus, they sharpen just the tip. 
Um, and then the rest of it is like filed to not be as sharp. So it goes into the board, but if it actually hits somebody, it won't like cut all the way through as it enters them. You know, no, that's, wrong. that's a conspiracy theory. That's not right. Okay. It's all sharp. Don't don't now, all up. circuses are real, like uh, wrestling. I was looking up that that actress too, Thelma Tixu Tisu. I can't pronounce her last name. The little uh, she was oh, a, the older lady. The uh, the the That's tattooed good. woman. Yeah, she was like a famous burlesque dancer from for a long time. That makes sense. Um, makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's really cool to see her in this. Tattoos yeah. are real janky. They're like the greasiest tattoos you'll ever fucking see. Because <laughs> yeah. like as we see, Orgo's got the badass chest tattoo. Uh, that looks actually pretty decent, except he's just like ridiculously hairy. Um, but her tattoos look like a fucking three year old drew like fucking animals and was like, let's put this on a body <laughs> all the way yeah. up her fucking face. It's I don't know. Yeah. That's she, she just got those in a back alley somewhere. Um, <laughs> yeah, is the father's tattoo a tattoo or is it a scar that his father gave him? It almost feels like it's the family seal in a way, it, 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 it is because. Um, I feel like, you know, if, if you, this has been statistically proven time and time again, if you come from an abusive household, you are more likely to be an abuser as weird as that logic is. Yeah. Um, that sets the model and you imprints on you or whatever the term is. Um, so it, it seems like, uh, generational trauma has, I feel like it's been a theme the past few years, especially like post COVID people have kind of woken up to stuff. And I also think that's part of it with social justice movements getting steam is that it not even just marginalized groups can address their own trauma, but when we're able to address the trauma, generational trauma of marginalized groups, we're able to address generational trauma in general. Um, even if you're, you know, a, a patriarch like me who enjoys stepping on the rights of women. Uh, right. But uh, sometimes I feel like my trauma is not real. And also, like, does everybody has trauma? Some people would be like, my trauma. I'm like, I don't know. Is that, tra- is that, that's a traumita. That's a little, <laughs> I don't know if that's a, any, anyway. No, I, 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 I see what you're saying. But, um, it's Once like, you ran out of chocolate milk and uh, it was traumatizing. Go on. <laughs> well, it's like we get, um, the scene where, you get introduced to the mother and she's like trying to stop her church from getting bulldozed. And she has like all these fucking people of the church trying to help her and stuff. And at first you're like, wow, this is uh this is intense. Like good for her trying to keep her small little union intact and stuff. And uh, I, lo- I love the reveal of how insane it is when the priest goes in there to check it out. And uh, it's like, this is not part of my parish. This isn't sanctioned. Yeah, it's like she kind of like disguises it as like a small sect of like Catholic Catholicism. So the Monsignor comes in there and it's just like, yeah, yeah, this is tight. And then walks in and she's got a pool full of uh, a woman with no arms, blood, and uh, fucking uh, like a whole sanctuary with a, a armless model. And it's it's weird. It's it's um definitely something. Also, just a side note of the the Monsignor. It seems like he has good intentions. He doesn't seem like a bad guy, although yeah. you know he's a Catholic priest, so it's always skepticism is advised. But um, he doesn't roll up in a nice car in a poor neighborhood, which is just a little set prop. I don't even know what you call it thing that I appreciated. And there is something though, how you know we romanticize trauma a lot of the times. And I feel like we're getting out of that as a culture. Um, But like the hard boiled badass with a dark past is really romanticized things like that, especially in cinema in American cinema, especially. Um, And in this movie, you made a saint of this woman because she was um, raped by the way, massive trigger warning for this entire cast. Uh, Going to be a lot of talk about that. Yeah. Um, But she was raped and her arms cut off and that makes her a saint. But like, did she feed the poor? Did she do anything, you know, or are they just like romanticizing and almost deifying this woman simply because she was a victim, which is not to say that we shouldn't respect that or whatever, but I don't know. There's just almost this fetishization of pain 
Uh, it's very Catholic. I'll just say that. Yeah, I was going to say it's, I mean, directly. Oh, Casher, uh, you're Catholic, aren't you? Uh, I am a reformed Catholic. <laughs> yeah. Not practicing for well over a decade. <laughs> yeah i mean but you're once a catholic always a catholic kind yeah of. yeah yeah i have tried. yes yeah <laughs> i was I mean, methodist we're... so i don't i don't, it was just like i'm here for the donuts and i don't care <laughs> yeah you're the you're the pussy catholics no we're yeah we're <laughs> methodists or wimps and i don't care we don't care about it they were like i don't know you can be gay I don't care. <laughs> it reflects how much they fetishize santa maria the holy mary you know it's in in actual catholicism it, it gets intense especially yeah. down or even you know the crucifix oh, i know it, but like even in like in Mexico, like insane. Virgin Mary is like this intense. Well, you figure. get into the you get into the the. There's a real mystical side to Catholicism that even yeah. This reminds me more of like Santeria. Yeah, Santeria. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's all that. Of... What that's Santeria for those of you listening who don't know. It's basic. It's basically what happens when you get missionaries to spread Christianity to quote unquote pagan parts. There's a syn- syncretic fusion of beliefs so like oh let's take all of our like weird ancestor uh worship things from like our native land and then mix it with catholicism and make it all weird and it's santeria i was talking yeah. to some venezuelans once and i referenced it and they were just like i don't even want to talk about santa Maria. that stuff crazy i uh i was I, w- I was friends with a girl uh i haven't seen her in a long time she was she's a she per- practiced santeria okay uh, she also didn't have a crystal ball um <laughs> uh, but uh, also shout out Joey Diaz, who's a practicing Santeria. I was about to ask. No, he, yeah. Uh, he, yeah, he grew up with that Cuban Santeria shit, and he talks about how crazy it got it's at times. It's super interesting. It's something that like that's her it. and I got deep with. That I, if I were religious, that's something that I go through with because I like just like the mysticism of it, and I don't know. Um, well, I it's can see why certain friends of ours like it. I'm not going to name names because it's so close to the occult in a lot of its ideals. Yeah. And like, I don't know. It's a little crazy. more benevolent, a little bit more benevolent, still weird. Um, it's it's definitely, uh, well, Catholicism in particular, more than Protestantism, is very much based around ritual, which is essentially magic with a CK. Uh, you're, you're having to eat magic. the body and blood of Christ. I'm not joking. Yeah. And with transubstantiation literally becomes the flesh of Jesus inside your body. That That is a magic ritual where you're quasi-cannibalizing your tortured savior. Don't tell my mother that. <laughs> <laughs> but she also that, what that, correlates, what? that correlates to this uh, moment in the movie, which is called Santa Sangre, because this is the inception of his trauma really with his mother when at the start of it you know where he uh sees her just ready to fucking die for her cause and he like jumps and hugs her well he has those people holding like two which are like a common little group that show up when he needs it and that'll get we'll talk about that later but he's got the clowns and he has aladdin his right hand man yeah whatever the fuck he is um he's uh so he's like watching as they're trying to bulldoze this down uh, and at first, they're like, the Monsignor is going to spot for him. And while he's in there, he finds that pool of blood and he's disgusted and calls sacrilege. And uh, conscious basically like, nah, fuck you. You don't know what you're talking about. Like, <laughs> you're wrong. And uh, he's like, fuck it. Burn this shit or bulldoze this shit down. And it's like, it's brutal the way they do that. Like, they just like start immediately start going and like trampling over this fence. And in my head, I'm like, they've got protesters there. Like these protesters could like they don't give a shit about the protesters at this point. They just want whatever's gonna be so they can. They know they'll move. I also thought I know it's a set. It's I think it's funny they didn't like knock it down first with a wrecking ball. They just went straight for the bulldozer, and so you can see like the you know it's not a real building, but the towers like falling on the bulldozer operator. Like this is they don't have OSHA in Mexico. I think (laughs) I think you get a fine if you do follow OSHA in Mexico. Like this is taking too long, guy. We just need to knock the building down. So that that's fun. That's a fun. We're still in like the first five minutes of this movie. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, all all of these moments of uh, intense drama for him are very important, and how the film follows. Yeah, and it's all like a twenty four hour period, most of it. <laughs> but and then yeah, so after that, he like goes back and he watches his um his dad chug liquor and throw knives at the tattoo lady which is all weird and sensual. And then right after that, 
he goes and he peeps in on his parents having sex. Well, here, no, here's the thing. Concha comes up during that moment, during the knife fight or knife throwing and caught like fucking confronts him. And uh, that's when he realized that Orgo is a hypnotist uh, mm-hmm. and he can hypnotize uh, the wife. And again, trigger warning for this whole podcast, but he, he basically like puts her into a trance and, and assaults her. Like that sexual moment does not seem consensual whatsoever. Um and, and that's that also he, depends on if you believe in fucking hypnotism. So, well, I mean, they make well, no, hip- hypnotism is real. It's a me- it's a measurable psychological effect. Like you, you're the brain undergoes changes. Um, yeah. okay. a, a lot of it is it has to do with the complicity of the subject to enter a hypnotic state. Yeah, because uh, if somebody doesn't want to be hypnotized, you can't really hypnotize them unless you're Alakazam or something. But still, him looking in and, and seeing that happen at a young so age. Read, yeah reading on the wiki i mean anybody can edit the wiki but uh they say that he leads concha back to the circus where she discovers orgo's affair but orgo also being being also a hypnotist puts concha in a trance and rapes her okay either way this little kid should not be looking in and, and seeing this no absolutely not and uh he i just think about uh kids and the kind of stuff because it's different to walk in on your parents in a normal setting like oh no you know you're gonna think about that for the rest of your life but in this it just seems so damaging and um i this could be a very touchy subject but it it doesn't have to be sexual but is there anything you wish you hadn't accidentally seen as a kid that might have affected you like uh, if there is, I don't remember it. I definitely, probably, I think for me, it's uh, I'm I'm very um, touchy when it comes to gore in movies. I think it, probably because I saw accidentally some shit that I've blocked out as a kid. I've never looked up shit on purpose as a kid, but like very occasionally, someone will show you something. Oh yeah, you mean on the but, internet? Yeah, and um, I remember they showed. On CNN, with like no warning, they just showed uh, them hanging Saddam Hussein. <laughs> you remember that? Uh, I didn't watch. That it. is we a were newspaper really... family, so I yeah, just read. About I was it. a very like sheltered kid, and no one was on. No one. It was at my grandparents. They weren't. No one was watching the TV except for me, and I was like, "What's going on here?" It's like, "Oh, they're hanging a man on television." This yeah, is that's cool. that. Even back like that back then, it was like grainy footage too i know exactly what you're yeah. talking about because while you were like the me, guy that was like didn't seek it out i was the fucked up kid who did seek it out so okay well i i was... I, I, I had seen some stuff or shown some stuff i think that desensitized me i don't think some of that stuff traumatized me because i did see like accident real of uh, i don't know f- like police footage of stuff um i and as far as actual traumatized by things i saw probably if i think hard enough um, there are certainly things that affected me and probably in a negative way, certainly nothing to the extent of me being half naked in an asylum up on a tree <laughs> squawking at people. I know. I was just, I just do that for about fun. That. Cause like I do have an aversion to certain gore in movies. I could barely watch the first saw movie. And it's, it's so interesting to me cause you're such a, you know, movie guy, but that blocks off a huge chunk of horror movies. Yeah. A lot of which are schlocky and lazy. Anyway. Yeah, that's why but, I'm like, I'm I'm not even sure if I'll see the new Cron- uh, Brandon Cronenberg this week. Oh well. yeah, you can't. Well, let me ask you this: Can you play like Mortal Kombat? Because it's not. It's like a. Video I really game. don't like to play the new Mortal Kombat games. Right, because it's too. I mean, the the, the finishing though, moves. I'm just like, fuck this. This is yeah. annoying. Okay, but if if you're like punch a dude and like blood it's ma- like, i mainly hate like brains and like in innards in innards yeah stuff okay. like that. i'm still surprised so, no, no chitlins uh, for adrian i'm surprised that you went and saw the fucking new evil dead with me 2013 yeah yeah that uh, that uh that's like almost like zombified shit though that fucking i hated that i, I yeah that no movie. that's like uh <laughs> That's one of the most intense movies I've seen, but for some reason it all checks out. Like I can handle arms getting chopped off and blood and all that. 
It's like a tendons hanging the arm as she's like <laughs> sawing it off. I'm like, and I'm I like gore. Like I I get I enjoy the feeling. You were of gagging though. Disgusting. Yeah. Well, it's like I enjoy that feeling. I'm gonna look at a lot of you. Uh, and so I was very surprised that she were into that. <laughs> so so, yeah, I remember you had to like look away when they were pulling the nail out of the eye. Ah, I can't do that. I can't do up close fucking slices and like even that classic, very classic silent film where they take the barber's blade and slice. Oh yeah, across dude, that the that, that scene rules. Fucks me up. Uh, you, you, you're also I'm, you're talking to a guy. I watch popping videos and medical videos for fun. So. <laughs> bear well anyway i'll just be like ooh, giant gallon of pus abscess from a cow let me watch this anyway rib saddam hussein let's move on no No, not not in peace (laughs) (laughs) r.i.h in hell the next thing no the next thing's pretty brutal well he watches that elephant die yeah which is you can't really understand why it's happening please don't die well yeah that spoke to me on a level uh as a kid especially when i started to really become aware of my own mortality and not really understand why things happened. And the, and they just did that, that spoke to me. And especially like watching that him, watching the elephant die and the following funeral weirdly and surprisingly made me emotional because I guess it really dawned on me how important this memory is like attached to his psyche and everything's amplified by the musicians kind of consoling him in a way and playing that music. Mm. I, I don't know. It's like something around, like, it's like horrifically beautiful in like a, cause life is like complex that way. Yeah, and no, dude, I will uh, say that everything fucking about elephant, that spoke to me. The, ele- the, the effects that they use to make the elephant look sick and passing away are fucking gnarly. Yeah. It's like blood out of the trunk. Just consistently, like it's, I, it's a fake elephant, of course, but like that looks fucking like yeah. that's disturbing. Like that would traumatize any kid. It would traumatize me as an adult. Yeah, yeah, it's like your pet, only it's your highly intelligent, one of the most intelligent animals on earth pet that's very unique. Yeah. Dying yeah. for no reason. And then what? They have the funeral and like drop this massive coffin into like this fucking dump that's Ravine. in the ground. Yeah. yeah. And the, all the people swarm it and start taking the meat. That that might be my favorite scene of the movie. Just because I love that scene. Yeah, I, I, I saw everybody really standing. It's just the way the audio and it's that like 80s compressed audio of them all cheering ah, and going down and getting it's the meat. fucked it's di- it's dist- it's great before yeah right up before right like. before they do that though that whole scene is like very beautiful to me you know it is part. and the in that gut punch that transition yeah is what makes it work you know funerals are beautiful um just for example my my papa uh granddad um died you know a few months ago and there's a there's the guy with the bagpipes, and it was you know he played Amazing Grace, um, which I don't even know if that was something he asked for. And they like then he kind of like walked off into the field uh, to signify the passing. And like there's a beauty to it. In sure, a, in yeah. Um, yeah, we had um we had I forgot this would even happen, but at my grandfather's funeral there was um uh, the the military, you know the the guys who come up and yeah, his too. Yeah, I was like, oh shit, I forgot because he spent that time in the military fucking 70 years ago that this would happen, you know. It oh, was yeah. cool. No, it was. And it, and it was in the was... rain too. It was cinematic. I can't oh, lie. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> mine, 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 he like saluted off into the into the like distance after like giving the flag to my grandmama, but then it looked like he was saluting at my dad for some reason, and we were all very confused. And then he walked off. And my dad was like, I don't know if I should salute back. I, I wish know. your dad would have saluted. That would have been dad. so fucking funny. I would have loved it. Oh, that we were joking awesome. about it the whole way home. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know. Be kinda, I don't know. Is that what soldiers do on their weekend? They're just like, oh, a guy died. You want to they get paid? They, they, probably, they probably have like a, a time sheet of like, okay, you got to do your time. <laughs> like, uh, you're like on call like a doctor. It, no, it's like, it's your turn. You have to go do this this time. Yeah, dude. You got to. Or some of them, here's the thing, if you're the trumpet player, that's the thing. If you're in the military, you want a job like trumpet player or barber or interpreter. (laughs) Bill Dotree. Yeah, like Bill Dotree. You don't want to, you don't, dude, imagine just being a barber and then you get that pension and then you can just open up your own shop. And even if you're not making that much money, you're making that army pension on top of it. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're you're set, man. Why did did I go to college? (laughs) And I, uh, well, it's like, what, Phoenix... 
but they're at the funeral and he has the natural response you know he's overwhelmed he's crying he's sad yeah, they're ripping an elephant apart of course he's crying you it's know like that's his what childhood. makes it fuck it's his childhood pet essentially he grew right. up with it. and his dad looks at him and like stop crying like a little girl yeah stop acting like a little girl all this elephant is being girl. ripped apart and that's when that is the moment in the film when i realized this movie was hitting me way harder than it did the last time and yeah. and for people at home i'm gonna get real with you and say that i have a problematic and abusive past with my dad and this film spoke to me in that way i be just obviously i didn't have that intense of a fucking back story but um Oh, you yeah, don't have a dad yeah. tattoo? I've got one. You want to see mine? <laughs> yeah, your dad's affected me, man. Phoenix in your chest. <laughs> I think it's because the first time I watched it, I was 21, 22. And I think that age is still a little too close to childhood. And I think those years are, you're not, well, you're not far enough away from childhood to fully sit around and recontextualize a lot of events, I think. Yeah, I think around 25 is the age when I, I started really thinking about stuff more and having actual depth and like personal revelations when it comes to that. Because my my college years or early 20s, late teens is more of like a block shit out, party, do shit. And then you're still not fully developed. You're not fully adult. And now as a man in my late 20s, uh, I'm definitely more able to recontextualize my past so that's when this movie started hitting hard as fuck because like the scene right after that he ties his fucking son to a chair which is jodorowsky's real son yeah and gives him a fucking tattoo with a knife big old spread eagle phoenix and like spread eagle across the block. <laughs> um that is one of the most fucked up fucking scenes too especially it's pretty fucking brutal it, it's pretty brutal it's kind of and... uh trauma inducing in a way like uh well, you know and then he dresses his dad dresses him up like himself well this entire movie is largely about people well especially we'll get to the mom later but living through their children which you can argue anybody who procreates is kind of yearning for a sense of immortality or a sense yeah. of something beyond themselves and living through their children but there's people who take it wrong there's even people i think who do it benevolently but it's still in a messed up way i always think of those parents who will pay for their kids 21 or even younger year old kids to go to palm beach beach spring break or whatever just to get tetanus and hepatitis um <laughs> it's it, but that's a way of living through your kids like all right go do ghb son i love you um yeah. wish it, my mom fucking said that that'd be tight but also yeah. like um it's it's dark still though some parents cannot handle their kids wanting to lead their own lives and have their own interests. It's mind boggling. To it me. is mind boggling. If I feel like if I had a kid, the goal would be to get them out of the freaking house. <laughs> See, I think, uh, I think there's two sides of it. You definitely have to get like a balance on it. Cause of course you want to stay in contact and be in your kid's life. And you want them to do things that are, you know, in the right like way, whatever that way is. But then you also have parents that are just like, you turn 18 and you are completely cut off uh and uh really not cared for in that situation like for me it was like 16 and like my, my dad didn't really have anything to do with me as much until you know in the past like four years um so it's like it's one of those things you know there's two spectrums to it you got to have a a balance of not enabling and coddling but also supporting and nurturing like i don't know yeah so what it where where does carving a tattoo in your son's <laughs> chest lie on that i'm chest? telling you if you like, don't have I don't a bad tattoo to you know to be gay you so don't have trauma tattoo into his chest. Got my dead tattoo. Right yeah. Up. The worst part is he says, yeah. now Smoke you're up, a man. Johnny. <laughs> he says, now you're a man just like me. And it's yeah. like, okay, this guy's fucked. But no, also it's right. like, we, I also want to drop. They mentioned that they think he's uh he's American and he's running away in Latin America and Mexico. Cause he killed his ex-wife. Uh, yeah. That's, that's a line dropping early in the movie. So, you yeah. know, he's a cool guy, Brett Michaels. <laughs> Not Brett Michaels, goddammit. It's <laughs> um Vince Lombardi or whatever. Yeah, my dad oh, was not... always Go ahead, my dad, sorry. My dad was heavy on like um 
saying, oh, this this shit you're doing is for babies. Quit being a baby. Be a man. This and this and this. Just belittling my interests and like things. I was a soft kid. I, I It took me a while to kind of uh, grow up. And um, I remember him shitting on me because I was watching Pokemon in like fifth grade and still watching Pokemon. He called it a baby show and called me a baby and all this stuff. And I remember it really affected me. And it was like... My mom was like, what do you care what he watches? Like, uh, he likes it. He finds it enjoyable. It's not a big deal. And uh, obviously, the to contextualize for people at home, my dad is very much from an old world. He came from Yugoslavia overseas, hardened, picking tobacco in fields at fucking age six, shit like that. You know, like, he's from a completely different world. But that's what I don't understand is, like, this mentality that a lot of older folks have of like, oh, well, I, when I was your age, I had to do this, this and this to get to school and this and this and this. And I had to do all these things. Do you not want your child's life to be easier than the way you had it? Bro, that is exactly know. how I feel about it. Yeah, that's fucking that's exactly what I think about it, because it's like I have just because you had obstacles. The goal as a parent is to make sure your kids do not have those obstacles yeah is to provide a better life and that's been the goal of parents since fucking cavemen cavemen wanted to provide and protect and nurture and it's instinctual in us and anybody who ignores that is a fucking sociopath yeah man this this would be a lot better if one of us was a dad <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have, if... i'm just a bad dad no, okay. I, just, just, uh... I'm just kidding. I don't have a, i don't have kids i was like ah we shouldn't have gone to planned parenthood the podcast yeah. would be better <laughs> nah, if I was a father, I would be doing everything in my right to be the opposite of how my yeah, father was. You wouldn't but, be like, okay, son, get on the podcast. You're six. We're casting like, Dante Sangre. Watch this movie. I found you will myself watch Kino. I oh. found myself magically not being into Pokemon anymore. Really, after that, which uh, I didn't mean for that to happen, but it psychologically affected me. And uh, yeah. And which is a shame because I it took me a while to come back to Pokemon. I think because of that incident, I just um, came back to Pokemon after twenty years, man. <laughs> yeah, well, I never stopped. Again, I didn't have the issue of my dad uh, not supporting or like not or commenting on things I like. My dad just didn't care about anything I did because he didn't want to pay attention to me because I was a little fat kid. Yeah. Unless I played sports, and then I just disappointed. So yeah, I was never interested in football, and I I think I. Because the one that my dad was in and out of my life so often, the the few times I did see him, he would just sit around and watch football all day. Obviously, because it's you know it's his day off or whatever. And uh, I think uh, I started to resent sports because of that reason. And oh yeah, that's interesting. That's why I probably never got into it, even though like I I tried playing all the sports. I think it's also I just naturally don't like sports. I'm not good. Yeah, at also we're three fat movie nerds. So I, I uh, like sports. I, I, enjoy sports a I lot. tried soccer. I tried basketball. I uh basketball is the worst thing I've ever been at anything <laughs> ever. <laughs> Why my mom sat through like four seasons of me never making one goal is you 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 said it's called a basket. Yeah, I was about to say yeah, it's not a basket. Goal. Sorry, whatever, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. You did uh, four seasons of basketball. Le- yeah, like I th- yeah, like fifth, fourth, third. I think Jesus. so. I did like you have a I, loving mother. <laughs> yeah, she you know she tried to let me try different things. She let me try ice skating, stuff like that. And see, that's the I thing. Even know we had my, that in Arkansas. My mom on the other reason she never genderized things if i wanted to watch a barbie movie she didn't give a fuck if i wanted to like play dress up she didn't give a fuck i had an easy bake oven stuff like that so like she definitely let me just go as i wanted to and it was the opposite i think she was compensating for the way my dad tried to be yeah so, sure. no, i'm not trying to turn this into a therapy session it's just uh these well, are just know, the I'm, things I'm charging by the hour, don't worry. Yeah, I was about to say you just, gotta start paying us. These are just the things that this simple scenes in this movie like brought out of me, and I, I was completely affected by uh what Yodorowsky was trying to say. Because no, I mean wa- watching him carve a knife into a fucking little kid's chest is you know, it's intense. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Did Brian Singer direct this movie? <laughs> 
God damn. Jeez. We were, we were uh, talking about Superman. Yeah, we were. I, uh, yeah. Uh, quick side note. I've been marathoning the original Superman movies, and I was asking if I should watch Superman Returns. And then I looked it up, and not only is it directed by Brian Singer, a pedophile, but it also stars a pedophile, Kevin Spacey. So like, he's damn. the villain. He's Lex Luthor. I know. I know. I he's know. a bad guy. I know. Yeah, but Lex Luthor was just the villain of Superman. He didn't fuck kids. It's a... <laughs> That's a, quite a pedigree of pedos that movie has. The real question is how they got pedigree. They could barely get Gene Hackman back for the second one, and he wasn't in the third one. But they somehow got him back for Quest for Peace. What the fuck? Do you probably just? It's one of those things he probably just owed the IRS or something. Like <laughs> anyway, he made some bad investments. Anyway, I mean, that, that happens. I know. I know. Nicholas Cage nope. did the same shit. Yeah. Every but, actor um, does that. The next scene's pretty. The next scene's the most like insane, insane fucked up. Well, scene. I think it's the second most insane. There's a scene later that gets okay, fucked well, up too much. So uh, yeah, but the concha, you know, during your trapeze act, fucking sees Orgo consummating the affair with the tattooed woman, uh, which I cannot express to you much how disgustingly attracted I am to that tattooed lady. <laughs> what the fuck is? I don't know why she. It's it's. I don't know. It's fucking feral. Um. But she gets sulfuric acid and pours it on the genitals of uh which is Orgo. sitting on a cabinet for some reason, right? I there. was I was saying that scene actually made me laugh a little because they had a giant it said H2SO4 giant sulfuric acid thing just sitting behind the circus. I don't know. It's, it's like amazing. shark repellent. <laughs> <laughs> uh pours it on his genitals, and uh, you know, after that, Orgo's pissed, Orgo's mad, his dick's falling off, goes and kind of uh what does he do he venerates the the woman concha by cutting off both of her arms just like the saint just like a little martyr she is she no longer has arms yeah and then walks and, the but the whole fuck part thing. is that uh the son is trapped inside of the uh rv the whole time locked inside the trailer and there's nothing he can do but like spectate and to me that makes it more powerful it's the you know taking the way any possibility of control of that situation obviously psychologically that's what they're going for and i also like that the little girl sits next to the trailer and keeps him company even though this shit's going on obviously that's yeah very I'm a sweet to i'm a sweet despite all of her and i i, I do like I want to say I like her makeup. I don't know what it represents, but like her outfit and makeup is really cool. It's a mime. I thought she was just a mime. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and she's she's deaf and mute, so I mean, a mime. So they're they're playing off of that, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I thought it was cool. Which I, I don't think we gave a little any. Alma was adopted by the tattooed woman, which is fucked. We'll get to that in just a second. Oh, yeah. But like, uh, you see your own father running out with his dick bleeding, and like. How do you even so comprehend that? And then, and then slitting his own throat. Yeah, the man would rather kill himself than live without a dick. That's uh, a man. Wait. That's a man after the culture, right there. <laughs> he just ends it right there, dude. That's fucking gnarly as hell. Fuck yeah, it's it's pretty fucking. What would gnarly. you do? Would you live without a dick? I, no. I think I could. No, it wouldn't be that much of a difference. I'm not doing horse dick dot mpeg, man. It would, it would just <laughs> yeah that's a great reference to a masterpiece comedy called uh i don't this even march yeah, this march <laughs> rest in peace trevor it's one of those titty uh, movies me and capture yeah. watched in 10th grade because it was a wise kids you know connect so much um but then what that's the end of the backstory for you we hop back to the present where phoenix is still in the asylum and uh, they dress him, get him ready, and they're taking him out. They're taking him on a trip. They take him out of movie to the movies with a group of the mentally handicapped kids. Yeah, all of them uh, have Down syndrome. Most yeah, same, same same thing. Same I'm thing happens in the ring. Politi- I'm just being politically correct. Where the fuck do we get ice cream? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Next episode, is... we're doing the Ringer. Yeah, I, I, I don't care. I unironically like that movie. I don't. Care. Uh, this is the most fuck scene. Yeah, for this me. is the greasiest. That when I, I feel like I, we keep saying that. No, this I is sold, the best. Years ago, I sold this movie immediately to Cody Long by saying that this movie had a scene where a guy 
gets a group of mentally handicapped <laughs> Down syndrome kids high on coke and then gets them laid with a fucking prostitute. With a 400 pound prostitute. Yeah. Too. Which is Massive. like, you tell that to a normal person, they're like, fuck this, fuck this movie. <laughs> and to Cody, he's like, I'm watching this immediately when Dude, I get th- home. Thanks uh, to our podcast fans who are into watching <laughs> Down syndrome kids. Well, it's like, I love this. I love the way that they're walking through this, like these alleyways and they're all just kind of dancing. He's got his music on and then he turns off the music as they pass. What did they pass? I can't remember what they pass. But he turns off the music as other music's going and they respectfully walk past and he cuts it back on. <laughs> that guy like, fucking dude. rules, dude. I yeah, no, I fucking love him. The pimp that's played, yeah, he's fucking sick. He like pulls out hey, coke this and all your problems kids. will go away. Like, you gotta be next level to fucking get down syndrome kids high on coke, dude. That's and then get them fucked. Crazy. What like, a cool all those guy. kids are down. I mean, not I mean they're literally, <laughs> down, but they're also down for the fucking no. Oh. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna cut that from the record. <laughs> ah, glad, glad we could get demonetized. Well, while, um, while they're all having fun, though, you get the immediate the Phoenix spots her out, and old tattooed ladies getting uh, having fun, not getting yeah uh, with uh, like dancing in the streets type shit. No. Uh, yeah, and he, he, bitch. he immediately just starts like getting consumed with rage. Yeah. Um. And then we learn that she uh, is in charge of the the deaf mute and pimping her out, and which is Fucked evil, up. evil. And not only is she pimping herself out, but she she tells that fucking giant mongoloid guy that uh, he can just go back there and have his way with her because she can't, she can't do anything to stop yeah. it. He, he looks military too. Like I know, it's here. just that's one of the most evil fucking things. Oh, it's for disgusting. someone to do. And immediately I was like, I forgot about that part. And I was like, yeah, there's no one I want to see die more than this lady. Cause I remembered that she does die. And I was like trying to remember the circumstance of her death. And I was like, yeah, fuck you. I'm ready for this to happen. I just, yeah. that's so despicable. And it's not out of the ordinary for shit to happen in these like weird sects of like towns, especially back then when there was I mean, less- money is money. You know, like no fucking, no sympathizing with these people at all. They're fucking evil, but money is a good influence to fucking make you do bad things. Look, if what other skills do circus performers have? Yeah, I was right. thinking that during this movie, I'm like, is there a retirement plan for circus performers? <laughs> hey, man. Is there like what do you do if you decide to not? Like, I've been shot. juggling for 20 years, and I want to do a different career. Uh, it's a hard. You it's join a hard the stuff. Harlem Globetrotters. Yeah, that's, um, that's true. What Phoenix goes back to the asylum and his mom calls out for him, and yeah, he's good. He's back to being him again. Yeah, he escapes. Good for him, right? He goes, yeah, yeah. and you're like, well, why does he go back into the show business? Because that's all he knows. Yeah. Uh, you know, before the reveal at the end, obviously. Well, I just love that he's walking on the street and he just finds Aladdin shine on shoes. He's like, yeah, Pop. he's and like, all right, let's go. Shine. Aladdin's like. Fuck it, let's go. Aladdin's a bro, dude. Aladdin's I Aladdin. love Aladdin so much. Yeah, like, fuck that yeah. character is so good. Um, but then we get tattooed woman after she tries to prostitute Alma. Like later that night, Alma escapes. Obviously, she yeah. leaves and she sleeps on the street for the night. But we get one of the more graphic fucking like stabbing scenes I've seen in an old. Yeah, that's fucking it's, awesome. It's like first person psycho type shit, and it's just blood and blood and blood, and her getting repeatedly stabbed in the back, and just like, fuck her. Yeah, yeah, fuck very, her. Very fuck happy her. that that happened. Because <laughs> yeah, right before that, I was like, she just gets stabbed because you know she cheated on you know she was part of a affair and then i was like oh yeah no she's a piece of shit she pimped out this deaf girl yeah fuck her that's when i like i like when I, I, they give me the chance to like cheer for awesome blood and like horrific killing because no, it's like too, i love that shit i get off yeah of, there's a reason why i become ultra but yet, but yet you were traumatized movies. by killing saddam hussein that's a realistic kind of thing are you saying you're a supporter of Saddam Hussein, because <laughs> the rest I, um, of us were cheering. I, uh, you know, you look a little. Okay, like let's Saddam. not be fucking mean. Sorry, sorry. Um, it's just I'm jealous because I can't grow a mustache as well as you. Yeah, but I can't grow a beard as well as you, so it evens out. 
We so. need to, that's why we need to have a child. We need to clone <laughs> yeah. a, clone a, a hybrid. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> no, I I get the whole celebrating the deaths of the 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 evil or just like the enemy. Um, there's a reason why I get patriotic as fuck during World War II movies. Um, <laughs> I know, dude. I love, I love. Uh, I get real. Well, no, that's I'm talking World War II. Um, I, uh, it's like I, I don't know. I was watching. I've watched movies with like my old roommate, and he's like a big communist. And uh, we watched like Saving Private Ryan or like 1917, which is World War One, or any of these like old school war movies and immediately you're just like yeah devil dogs fuck these fucking crowds like, like <laughs> we were, we were on the side like... of the communists for a minute there <laughs> yeah but with world war ii it's like there's nothing more evil than fucking and nazis fucking so well that's know. the problem this is getting off top that's the problem with world war ii as a piece of propaganda because then you can kind of compare every military conflict to world war ii and act like america's always the good guys oh world yeah war Sounds then, like Scott's a Nazi sympathizer. Then, uh, yeah, no, the same sympathizer I'm, 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 don't Nazi. even fucking joke about that shit. I'm blaring Kanye records all day long. <laughs> Jesus. That's Ooh. fucking sad. But, <clears throat> anyway, he gets back into show business. He falls back in to things. And what I mean, like, he, he starts, he's, he's, like, almost destined to repeat these things things that led to his trauma but now as an adult which is also kind of like a reflection of actual people who were abused that end up abusing you know uh it's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot and also being a complete piece of shit but also like even on the softer side do you ever like find yourself doing actions or having mannerisms that kind of remind you of your parents and then you get kind of upset by it Yes, um, absolutely. Um, in 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 ways that uh, my parents were not abusive. Fortunately, um, I I live with them. Uh, moving on, I got a rental application gone. Okay, but uh, we fine. also we we should also say that Scott has lived away from his parents for years and years up until now. It's not like yes. he's been living with them this whole time. No, no, it's there's been like there's a 10 difference. Years. I was 19 when I moved out, and I was 29 when I. Yeah, or twenty eight. I just um, want to make that distinction. No, it's been a few months after living outside the country. Um, <laughs> but the uh, so yeah, I don't know. There are things that definitely I I don't want to get too much into detail, but sure, I I have a lot of anxieties that I realize are shared, you know, by my parents and certain personality traits that are just kind of genetically passed down. Um. And I realize it more now. I have more sympathy for my parents um, and some of their foibles. It's like you get to that age where I feel I got, or at least I got to an age where I could see my parents' foibles more. And like you're a teenager and you're very frustrated with them. But then as you get older, you can see them as human more so you can accept them for their flaws yeah. mostly. Um, my mom still gets her stakes like medium well. And that was like 10 years of arguing with her. So. Still matter for that, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. We'll get to medium someday. Yeah, no, my mom eats her steaks. Well done, boy. Dude, fuck your mom. I'll murder your mom. <laughs> I'll and I'll do it with the steak because if it's well done, that's a blunt force instrument right there. Yeah. What is I up can't... with white women and well done steaks, dude? Dude, kill white women. It's like Facebook, like bullshit. Before Facebook was even a thing, I don't understand how '90s moms. <gasps> all passed around this misinformation like i don't know all moms at the same time were like pokemon means pocket monsters that means it's of the devil and then for like six months we're all on this tirade about pokemon yeah it's fox like, news stay yeah basically it's but, it's, um, for I do, I, occasionally I, I find myself doing similar mannerisms i'm like fuck this but at least it's not a, a, on the extreme side where like my dad's such a pathological liar that I'm like, it is like had the reverse effect on me to where I, I like try to be as truthful as possible about things. And, D and does he, your dad just lie for no reason? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Just because he it's, wants to. It's actually insane. Yeah. That's it's a weird one. I never really got. And it's like, now I, it's like, I'm always going out of my way to be tr trying to be as uh, clear and communicative as possible when I'm trying to express myself. <laughs> Cut, cut to Adrian and his wife. Does this dress like make me look fat? Yes, baby. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like, sometimes. Uh, I, no. I think a lot of the traits that I 
inherited from my mom and my dad uh where a lot of them were negative um as you guys have known me for well over a decade now at this point um there i i'm a i'm a way different person than i was when we met because i had a lot of unchecked tendencies sure uh, a lot of time there's a lot of hyperbole that i would speak um and then i you? also had oh yeah i had a <laughs> lot of uh anger issues yeah. um well, you guys remember my fucking i used to be incredibly angry angry fucking bitter person and then you no went reason. to a lot of music festivals uh and then i started doing drugs <laughs> 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 no uh but now you uh you have to check yourself on that i uh also uh my dad didn't believe in mental health issues growing up and my dad is very obviously having anxiety and an ocd disorder um and i picked up a lot of that and my mom has pretty terrible depression and i got that one too um so i'm just like three for three on the mental illness um but now that uh you know i've gotten my own coping mechanisms and things like that and then another awful thing is the alcoholism that runs with both of my parents um so i've been checking myself on that too i've been haven't had a drink or anything at all this month uh dry january uh, but i've recognized these tendencies and i try to correct them when i notice them yeah so so to... you're saying you wouldn't carve a phoenix into your child's chest i'm telling you i already have a dad tattoo and my child would have a dad tattoo too <laughs> um what, golf wing i i <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i will say i will say the thing i'm mad i didn't inherit is my dad six three and my brother six four and i'm yeah. five eleven and that kind of pisses me off sometimes but my, other than, my, my, thank my god dad. i'm taller than my dad my dad is six or no, he, yeah, he's, he says he's six foot. He's five eleven, And then my mom is like five foot seven and I'm good old six foot eight. Yeah. And you're just a freak. My dad's like yeah. five foot five. Thank God I'm taller than him. Dude, yeah. No, that's good. That's good for you that you're taller. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Squatty, squatty little Mediterranean man. <laughs> uh, uh, so he goes to perform and this performance isn't necessarily like a circuit. It's a weirder performance. It's just concha dancing uh and like singing and he is the arms now explain to me how that is profitable or is it is it at all is there an audience there at all well at first um i did think how do people buy the show but then a bunch of dancers and stuff came out more dancers and it was uh i don't know i guess more production value where i feel like people might want to and if you're in a poor barrio in mexico city or wherever you are you know yeah. you might not it's have a, a lot of options it's a small enough of a novelty to definitely pull in enough people and i i think yeah if, if, uh, if yeah people are like you know i'm a laborer and this is you know like a week's what? wages but it's my anniversary yeah. Well, like we go through this thing with like the he's the arms now, and then we get some idle hands vibes. I don't yeah. know if you guys have ever seen that fucking idle hands. Movie. I know what it is. Yeah. It's the shit. It's a really cheesy fucking thing. But uh, any woman that Phoenix is interested in, like the the she she kind of has an Alma vibe. The first woman, um, he lusts over her, and Concha doesn't like that, and Concha forces him to use her her hands, which are his hands, to stab her to death. Yeah. Uh, which is pretty fucking brutal. But he's also doing the same thing his dad was doing. He has her up exactly. against the board and he's throwing the knives and she's right. being sensual with it. The exact same movements of the tattooed lady were. So it's like, again, cycle. Yeah, it's a cycle. The and then also like, yeah, God. yeah. It's like he's no longer in control. His abusive parents, their influence controls his action like always. And obviously the scene takes that idea to the extreme. And you know it's it's a dream kind of, but it, it definitely shows him revisiting trauma in the most fucked way possible. But it you know we, you there's revelations of course at the end about what's actually going on. But uh, mm -hmm. and that's like that's where the creepy mama's boy shit comes in because he's literally being her arms now, which is the most extreme version of the narcissistic mother that living through your child. Be. Yeah, and like Literally. that that was very, really fascinating. Very Norman Batesy. Yeah, yeah. Do you think so. he like wipes her butt and stuff too? <laughs> but he it's smells a, it. It's after. a mannequin, so no. <laughs> uh, uh I do want to say that or whatever. Uh, the we get into like weirder territory with the next few scenes with the uh cross dressing uh wrestler. <laughs> that There's nothing weird about that, Cash. Oh uh, no, I don't know. Those bolted uh -oh. on titties were a little weird. Um Tasher, I you know I really don't appreciate your tone right now. <laughs> so 
sorry. It's a weird scene having a woman who's as big as I am and as fucking ripped as I am, uh, having her titties that don't. Yeah, move. you are, hold on. You are not that ripped, Casher. One second. <laughs> I didn't mean to say as I am more ripped than I am. I'm not. <laughs> I was like, don't, don't, so, don't over. Sorry. No, no, also, no, no, no. we should mention that he's having like invisible battles with like trauma yeah. like uh like hallucinations and shit. yeah yeah the hallu- yeah i forget about the hallucinations god um was it is this before or after when he goes to pick up the what is he picking up from that woman at the store at the store i don't really remember something for his show i think yeah, no, really chemicals. Matter. well he like starts to fight off this oh yeah dude there, for some reason i i still don't remember He's completely off the rails, I guess, at this point where he's like trying to imitate the Invisible Man movie. Yeah, and it's like, what the fuck? Disappear. Why are you doing this? I yeah. it's just weird. <laughs> like a hyper fixation or something. He's like mixing food coloring and trying yeah, to yeah and turn into the Invisible Man. <laughs> that's that's dude, like a, that's a badass special effect in the Invisible Man too. When they yeah, take his thing off and it's nothing there. Can you imagine being in the 30s, seeing that in theaters. And you're like, how the heck did they do yeah. this? Oh yeah, that's awesome. Um, I, I never read that H.G. Wells. I read. Uh, I like the remake better with Kevin Bacon. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, what he has that dream sequence though, after he kills the fucking uh wrestler though. Yeah. Where it kind of reveals that he's killed a lot of women. Yeah, he's a great because he pretty much kills any woman he lusts after. Um, which is a hot blooded man in his twenties, I would say. It's probably a lot. Yeah. Well, also I just want to say that, that his mom is the one telling him to kill the wrestler who should have been able to fucking break that man in two. I, I, and I think that's why he went after her. He's like, I'm gonna do this, but I want somebody to stop me. And that's yeah. why I find you attractive. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. But uh, but yeah. I think she was like uh basically didn't get it. Like she was walking away, like screw this, and then he literally stabs her in the back. No, yeah. yeah. Um, which you can't do much about. It doesn't matter how much I do want to say is as, as cool as Aladdin is and how he's there to be the supportive person, he's also the one doing the fucking grind house or like the monkey grinder fucking yeah, standing there. Well, well, he's he's not her real in that scene. Back. Yeah, yeah he's not real. Yeah. Well, I know that. I don't know we're revealing that. Yet. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. not fucking real. People have already Thanks, seen this guys. movie, hopefully. Jesus. Yeah, I mean, if if you, yeah, you come on. Uh, well, that, like, no, you think about that. It's like Aladdin and all those things are just like subconsciously things there to protect him from supportive. Trauma. That, yes. that was the scene where I was starting to question the reality of it. But here's the thing. It's Joe Dorowski, So I was kind of like, this can either not be real or just because it's Joe Dorowski, it's real because it's, it's, that's what yeah, he does exactly. in his movies. Yeah. Well, so, it's like I, uh, my buddy, and this I'm not going to go into like the full details of this. He did an extensive uh, ayahuasca trip uh, where it was done intravenously, yeah. and uh, it's about it's a seven hour trip, which Oof. compared to regular DMT is a 15 minute hallucination where you are being pumped and then saline is flowing through uh, into your arm. And during that, he had a uh interaction with his subconscious where it took a physical embodiment shout out to full metal alchemist brotherhood because that's how he's i'm telling you i explained that concept about brotherhood and he was like that was it like that's what it looked like i was like whoa um but he was going through these databases full of his memories and he would try to bring up traumatic events and his subconscious would protect him from those traumatic events saying they have already been resolved Wow! Away from other things. That's so sick. This is this is what that reminded me of. Is your subconscious is naturally going to protect itself? Absolutely. That's why we repress memories. That's why we, uh, you know, are able to reflect but not dwell. Um. So having Aladdin and the clowns there, they're especially the clowns in the beginning because he you only see the clowns really in whenever he's a child and then when he's released back into like a childlike state. Yeah. Um, Aladdin is consistently there, so that is like the main physical embodiment and it's protecting him for the most part uh that's why i was confused that he was the one on the organ grinder that's what i'm saying i know it's not real but why would he be enabling things that are damaging to phoenix right why wouldn't he step in and say phoenix stop you know yeah he was going crazy um yeah that that's a line well he doesn't have control of his own coping mechanisms they're certainly not healthy coping mechanisms no for um, sure it just it's the the way the subconscious works is a fucking weird thing yeah uh, and you have the dream sequence afterwards that allows him to feel guilt and remember the victims that he has and 
Makes yeah, which sense. brings some of the coolest imagery in the movie with all oh, the yeah. women naked and... white bodies with the veils over it and shit. That's fucking yeah. sick. Yeah. Like, why does he paint him white? Uh, I think it's like a ghostly. It yeah, makes him like... ghostly and dead. But also, it could be a callback to Alma, the person he was not able to protect. I think it's part of that. I think it's a callback to Alma, who's like his first love and imprinted on him. Mm-hmm. I think it's uh, ghostly and white. I also, this is, I'm being serious here. I I think there is kind of a phallic semen imagery to it as well. Huh. Um, potentially, maybe not. Your, yeah. semen, your semen's white. <laughs> yeah, mine's crusty yellow. What are you? <laughs> mine's fucking red as hell. Nice. Anyway, yeah. All this time, but it's like the it's like the the first half of this movie is like it feels like it's carefully guided, and then. The last like forty five minutes of this movie, everything starts to snowball, and like this movie, for as weird and artsy as is, it's it's a brisk pace to me. Yeah, watching it, yeah, uh, yeah, because it's it's weird. The plot is so, I, it doesn't unfold that linearly, but I feel like everything that happens is so intense that yeah. um, it makes it seem like a brisk movie. I yeah. I have a question. I don't know if we've gotten to this part yet or not. When when is the scene where he's seeing the elephant again and then he becomes that elephant dying? Is that it's close to happened? this? It's okay. close to the end. He starts succumbing to his own madness, basically. Yeah. Well, he, yeah, because uh, Alma comes back and uh, they plan to you know leave Concha and Concha, you know, tries to force Phoenix to murder Alma as well. Yeah. I couldn't remember if if uh, it was before or after he stabs the stomach like i think it's before him. okay and he yeah. starts to freak out and that is one of the more disturbing scenes of the movie is him just naked like spewing blood from his mouth yeah as he's the dying elephant yeah incredible fucking imagery really fucking awesome powerful and i will say um when he does stab his mom there's there was a big release of emotion from me as he like he find it's like a big release for him and it was for me too and uh, he like says goodbye to the clowns and the and Aladdin and stuff and the way they disappear and it's like Bing it's bong. not it's not subtle what they're trying to say here but and you probably guessed you wasn't actually there this whole time anyway but it's still very powerful imagery to me and yeah. um cuz then right then it, it cuts to the real memory of his mom being taken away by the stretcher. And that like triggered me. Like it broke me. Cause it like, like I got an actual like emotional response. Cause I know how hard it is to try and heal from certain trauma and like go back to certain memories. And it made me think of my inner child and what I wish I could do and go back and tell him and stuff. And just like, yeah, this that that's only the most powerful cuts in a movie for me is when it cuts to that the actual scene from his childhood that we didn't get before, and, and that's why I was like, yeah, this movie fucks. <laughs> this movie does fuck. And like him oh. destroying the marionette or the mannequin or whatever is like so cathartic, you know. Yeah, it's therapeutic. Oh, it's and even at the end when he's getting arrested, he's like, my hands, my own hands. Yeah, it's. Oh. Beautiful in a fucking dark, twisted way, man. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we'll give him insanity and he can just hang out with his buddies and get back <laughs> in the insane asylum. I, uh, yeah, but he, he goes through all those flashbacks. And like I said, that elephant comparison was a uh, disturbingly really well done. I really liked that. Um, I do like the fact that whenever she he does stab her, she disappears and then she comes back for a second as like, I'll always be a part of you. Very like horrific like, and realistic because that's yeah. sadly true yeah it's uh yeah and the whole you feel you feel relieved for phoenix at the end even though he's probably going to prison for life yeah uh, or, or back that's to that better than what he was doing or yeah or back <laughs> to the asylum it's nice that alma is kind of the one who brings him out of that when she hasn't she doesn't have to say anything yeah you can tell like, that almost she like a, she's almost like a guiding spirit in that way well you say that, you know what Alma means in Spanish? Soul. Oh, okay. Well, the then that's soul. less subtle than I thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, while I'm at it, concha, that means shell. Um, typically, I would think like a seashell. They have a bunch of different words for shells, like eggshell yeah. and shell. What does orgo mean, Scott? It's just orgo. Well, my, my point is, though, that adds to the metaphor of like 
She's yeah. enclosing him, holding him off, and she's hard herself. And when you open a shell, inside can be a pearl, or inside can be grit and dirt and nothing. And that's what was inside her yeah. um, this week of Scott Theater Analysis. <laughs> No, it was, a, it was a good. Also, we also we caused a lot of generational trauma by fucking over Latin America, and uh, a dad causes an American dad, American dad, uh, causes all the trauma in this. So that's probably it. Uh, also, Yoderowski's a play. piece of shit for different reasons that we don't yeah. have to go into detail. So uh, this is also an allegory for the war on drugs and Reaganomics. <laughs> uh, no, I like I said, I felt a sense of relief at the end, even though he is. Probably he's definitely going to be incarcerated or put into a mental institution. Him to have the relief of being free for the most part of the traumatic and has reflected and healed from it uh, as much as he can at this point. It felt yeah. nice. Yep. And su- yeah, surprisingly wrapped up really nicely, um, especially when you compare it to his more abstract films. It's like, okay, <laughs> wow, cool. <laughs> Um, there, I had something I wanted to read that, oh yeah, Roger Ebert, he said, uh, of this film, it's a horror film, one of the greatest, and after waiting patiently through countless dead teenager movies, I'm reminded, uh, the true psychic horror is possible on the screen, uh, which cracked me up, and then he said something about, someone said something about how this shows that, uh, there's not, like, redemption for evil evil is just evil because that like it's a realistic thing uh, i'm trying to find that i can't find it no uh, the, uh, that, that's that's true um and even if you can justify evil or why somebody's evil at a certain point there's an amount of evil that you can't i don't care how shitty your childhood was you know i don't care that you were rejected from art school you know sort of thing <laughs> No, this movie's uh, super psychedelic too, and I, I enjoyed. That. And you said it was one of your favorite movies you've watched for the cast, at least. Yeah, like definitely, uh, probably my favorite one we watched for the cast so far. I think this and Lahine. Oh yeah, too. fucking a. Yeah, the Man, two that both of these are in my favorite, like my top one hundred. So yeah, well, it's like both those movies for the those two movies for the cast are the ones that I've really resonated with. Yeah. Uh, God Lahan's the shit. That movie's the <laughs> shit, dude. Go watch our episode on that if you want. Um I dude, I'm such a freaking neckbeard and so I like met this French woman and that was like one of my first questions was like, Do you like Lahain? Yeah, I've seen what? that fucking movie. Yeah. And she was like, I've never heard of it. I'm like, Oh, well, I guess you're you don't know France then, bitch. The uh <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, pour no. me another drink. You can go ahead and pay me for that drink now. <laughs> It's a yeah, fantastic movie. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Next week we're doing Inside Lewin Davis. Look oh, forward nice. to that. Um, also, I'll have a new sponsorship next week. You'll have to see what it is. It's uh, uh McDonald's hot mustard. Is it your book? <laughs> uh, yeah. Just the um, hot mustard that is the sponsor. Anyway. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back next week with another banger episode of The Harbor. I'll have it. Obnoxious <laughs> editing. No, we don't do that here. All right. Let's... Another certified hood classic. <laughs> this has been <laughs> another b- 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 banger.